fossils in fiction, a show about ancient life, paleontology, and the stories we tell. The show is produced by me, Travis Holland, on Wiradjuri Country, with the support of Charles Sturt University. Enjoy! Jake Kotevsky is a PhD student in paleontology at Monash University. Jake's work has a focus on Australian theropod dinosaurs. You know, the ones with sharp teeth who walk upright, and particularly megaraptors. Rather than talk too much, I'll let Jake take it from here. I am in the second year of my PhD. I just passed the milestone on Friday, so what, six days now? So very, very freshly into my third year. Um... My PhD is focused really on theropods, yeah, meat-eating dinosaurs from Australia broadly. I've got a bit of focus on Victoria because that's where I'm based and that's where I guess most of the project is focused, but I've lately begun to branch out. So the initial, um, I guess, idea of this project was to look at all the material from Victoria, particularly what's in the collection at Museums Victoria, and re-describe it and see what we got. I've now turned that into effectively three projects because of some exciting material that's come out of it. And then I'm also going to be looking at Lightning Claw from New South Wales and then some, mm-hmm. hopefully some biomechanics on Megaraptorid Claws. Not a lot of attention or knowledge about Australian theropods out there. What are you finding? Well, I guess the key issue is we don't have a great deal of material compared to the rest of the world. Um, I mean, we've got a lot, a lot from Victoria, but it's individual broken isolated warped whatever you want to call it bones so we might get the bottom of a a leg bone that's been crushed a little bit this way and missing a chunk on the side and that's not terribly informative compared to say a 60 percent complete tyrannosaurus rex from um, central usa somewhere um we just don't have a lot of material we don't have a lot of established species or taxa because you know it's difficult to establish something off of a fragmentary bone. Um, And look, I mean, if I'm honest, everybody knows the North American dinosaurs because they're the fancy, well-known pop culture ones. And we need to work on that down Mm -hmm. here because we actually have a pretty exciting and interesting record. So is that the kind of motivation for jumping into the field for you? Um, want to get the Australian dinos a little more well-known or, or what was your sort of path? That's a funny one. Um, I think that's kind of become the aim over time. Um, so mm-hmm. I, this is my actual second degree in my second field. Um, I based my life on Jurassic Park. So I grew up loving the movie, loving the book. Mm-hmm. And I got to about year 11 or 12, and it's that kind of time where you're like, oh, what do I do with my life? What do I want to, how am I going to, how am I going to make a career? And there's two sciences in Jurassic Park, genetics and paleontology. And I had no idea about paleo in this country at all. I guess a bit of, I didn't search it up and it wasn't really a thing. I mean, I grew up in the northern suburbs of Victoria and it's not really a, a thing anyone really thinks about paleontology. Um, so. I just didn't think it was an option. So I pursued genetics the first time around. I did a genetics degree. I didn't really like it. Um, I did the undergrad and then I didn't do any further study. So I just kind of left it. I was working casually in hospitality at the time. And I, you know, I finished the degree and then I picked up more shifts just to pay rent because I'd moved out of home and got promoted to supervisor. And I was getting into that. I almost fell into the hospitality trap, but I absolutely hated it. So, you know, mm-hmm. every year I reread the book of Jurassic Park and I thought, oh, well, you know, may as well look up paleontology. You know, if I'm going to not find work in a field, I may as well love what it is because that was always the dream. I looked up paleontology of Victoria. I found Jeff Stilwell at Monash in Earth Sciences um, and I reached out to Jeff and after a bit of chatting, figured out maybe I should do a bridging bachelor degree um so i did a couple of units through open university of australia to get my earth science knowledge a bit uh to a better place did the undergraduate at monash in earth sciences um which then led to an honors degree with jeff and i think you know at that stage i'd worked hospitality for eight nine years and i was really not enjoying it um and so my aim was to I guess, look for work post honours. 
And during the honors degree, I got in contact with and had a good few chats with Dr. Steve Porapan. Um, and Steve has done really amazing things for Australian dinosaurs, quite a lot of stuff on the sauropods up in Winton. But mm-hmm. he's also looked at some theropods and ornithopods through either his own work or with students down in Victoria. Um, you know, we had a chat. I, he helped me out with my honours a bit of his own volition. So I I offered him dinner and a beer and took him out just to thank him. And, and he asked me what my plans were. And I said, well, you know, I guess I'll look for work after honours. And he, he asked if I'd considered a PhD. Now, again, at that stage, I had... I didn't have much of an idea of academia broadly or how things work. And I said, well, you know, look, that's another three, four years. I'm not sure I want to work and study anymore. And that's when he told me that you can get a scholarship for doing a PhD. And that kind of was like, oh, I, I didn't know that was a thing. I just, I, I guess I didn't ask the right questions or nobody told me. So I, it was an option um, and it was an exciting option. So I was like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd do that, but I don't know what I'd be doing. Um Jeff Stillwell wasn't really a dinosaur paleontologist and didn't really have anything lined up for me. Honours, my honours year was 2021, so we were still kind of suffering COVID, I suppose. There were still sporadic yeah. lockdowns. and Still there um, all over the place. Mm. So, yeah, Steve asked me what I'd want to do and I said, look, anything dinosaurs. So he he asked me if I'd like to look at the theropod record in victoria and he said look it's a lot of partial material it's scrappy it's a lot of grunt work it's just going to be you know descriptions and comparisons and i you know i jumped at the idea i mean theropods are what i really really always wanted to work on i mean they've been they've been the dinosaur thing that's always kept me interested they've been yeah the dream pretty much um so i just i leapt at the opportunity i'm like i'll do whatever i can as long as i can stay in this field and so Steve's only issue was he was also kind of not really having a, a solid position at the time, and I needed a main supervisor who was established at an institution. So thankfully, um, I'd CT scanned my honor specimen with Alistair Evans at Biology in Monash um, and broached him with the idea. I said, look, Steve's keen to be, the, I guess, the expert of the field. I just need a main supervisor. Are you interested? And you know, thankfully, Al took me on board. So two years later, here we are looking at theropod dinosaurs from Australia. Um, and, you know, my my understanding of theropods in Australia was pretty limited by then just because I guess it's not really a, like I said, it's not as, they're not as well known. They're not as well recorded. They're not as prominent in pop culture and such. So I, I didn't know what I was going to be looking for at the start. And as I've learned, what kind of groups we have exclusively here and I guess in Gondwana broadly I've just I've learned I've just built a love and appreciation for them and the desire to share that information so that you know the next I guess whenever it comes time the next generation are coming in and they have that knowledge of Australian dinosaurs and they want to explore and share it uh, so I guess that's a very long-winded story of how I got here but you know, it was, it was a very long, detailed snaking path that's kind of wound up to where it yeah. would be. That's, I, I often do ask people about their histories, and it's interesting to me how people take different pathways. You know, I, I don't know that uh, we can point to a single pathway and say this is the ideal way to get to where you want to be, whatever that, that happens to be. And so it does help people, I think, to hear well, okay, if you want to be in paleontology, sometimes it doesn't hurt to take a bit of a diversion in your case to genetics and to think about things for a while. And, you know, the, the Australian degree, uh, the, the Australian degree offerings in paleontology were pretty light on and it's really only been the last um, decade or less that from what I understand that, you know, UNE and Flinders and a bunch of others have started to build up these really healthy programs uh, and really offer Correct, it. So, yeah. Yeah, sometimes the the time is sometimes the time is right. That notion that you said about getting the PhD in and having effectively cross disciplinary supervision, someone from uh, bio and then someone external to your university from from paleo, kind of works pretty well, right? It does, and they bring different strengths to the table. Um, you know, yeah. Al Al is going to help with some biomechanical analyses, and you know, he's done a lot of. Uh, puncture pool testing in teeth 
I mean, his specialty is teeth and anything. A lot of students look at things like that, and they've done some uh, measuring of shape in claws and such. So there's a field that's, I guess, exploitable for me, aside from Steve's usual descriptions, comparisons, phylogenetic analyses. It's, it's kind of allowing me to exploit more of paleontology, which is a good yeah. thing because, yeah, it's that, it's that cross-disciplinary strength, I suppose. Yeah. And, and again, I think, you know, navigating that path, you talked about the difficulty of thinking through the PhD options and having to be sort of told, well, actually someone will, will pay you or give you a scholarship to do the PhD. Uh, again, unless someone actually puts those options on the table for you, the, the cross-disciplinary options or the, the scholarships or uh, whatever it happens to be, and is willing to kind of help you navigate the bureaucracy of universities sometimes people struggle to find those pathways and coming from well, yeah that's it and i mean you know i can always say you know cop a bit of self-blame i didn't ask but also i didn't know to ask and there's probably mm. quite a few students who don't know you know there's always the really keen ones which are great you know they'll go out they'll volunteer in labs they'll learn from the lab members what you can do but there's others who don't have that time or don't think to do that and want to keep going and they just they don't get that information presented to them so yeah no yeah. no look i absolutely get it I, when i entered the university system it was uh it was a baffling to me uh it, you know coming from a family where essentially no one had finished school, let alone university, it was it was certainly a struggle to figure out what, what possible pathways there even were available. Um, and, well, yeah, like yeah. you, I had some false starts. So, Yeah, and look, I mean, I'm a first-generation academic. I mean, second-generation Australian. My grandparents came from villages in eastern, like uh, in the Balkans. So this is – I don't have that parental expertise to help out they had no knowledge of it and I've kind of had to find my own way, which it took a while, but yeah. we've gotten there eventually. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, look, I, I, I appreciate you sharing that story and uh, I think it's, I think it's useful knowledge and a useful story to have out there. So Sorry, I want to quickly add to, you know, for those ones who do listen and don't have those pathways and stuff. The last thing I want to add to is in my first degree, I failed five units. It, mm. it and here I am in the third year of my PhD. It, it, those things seem like the end of the world, but they don't stop you. They don't matter in the end. As long as you apply yourself in the right way, if you find the right path, it is doable. You know, failure doesn't mean the end of it completely. You can find your own way around it. Maybe you just pick yeah. the wrong units. Maybe you're in the wrong degree. You can always shift and change and try again. Yeah, right. absolutely. And also there are support systems in place. It's not something you have to figure out on your own. So no, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, but you have to have the confidence and, and the, the cultural cachet to even know to ask as we've oh, already correct. said a couple of times. Yep. Yeah. Onto your specialty or what seems to have become something of your specialty, uh, mega Raptor day. Now this is a group that a lot of people might not even know the name of, although probably the people listening to this podcast do. But tell tell me about this group. Let's introduce them. Yes. All right. Um, you, they've kind of fallen into my specialty because they seem to be so abundant in Australia that anywhere you look, you're kind of going to be working on a megaraptorid. Um, so I'll give a quick background to the megaraptorids are a group of theropods. Theropods, you're meat eating. You know, typically meat-eating dinosaurs, um, think T-Rex, think Velociraptor and such. And, you know, you hear the term Megaraptor and you think raptors like Velociraptor. And that's because the original specimen, Megaraptor itself, um, included an isolated claw and it kind of looked like that sickle-like killing claw on the feet of the raptors mm -hmm. until six to eight years later when they actually published a specimen and the claw was associated with the hand. Um, and now we know from some Australian material that their feet don't look like the raptors at all. So it was called Mega Raptor because the size was just so massive compared to the rest of the raptors, but we now actually know they have no relation to what we call the raptors in the theropods. Um, I guess the best way to define Mega Raptors is a group of theropods for, known for big arms with big claws. They've got these really long arms and these massive, like, body size ratio length claws unseen in theropods broadly what we can tell of them they've got pretty narrow elongate faces with small teeth for their size so if you think something like t-rex big head massive teeth 
they're effectively doing something opposite where then the, the snout is elongate and they've got these rows of small teeth instead because it seems like the primary killing adaption is the forearms, the big hands, the big claws. Um, theropods broadly, they're known for those kind of air cavities in their vertebrae, much like the birds, because the birds come from them. Megaraptorids just take it to a whole other level. They've got massive, massive air sacs throughout all their vertebrae. They're known from Gondwana, the Megaraptorids. So Gondwana is the Southern Hemisphere, South America, Africa, Australia, Antarctica, New Zealand, and the Indian subcontinent before it shot up north. But we only see them in Australia and South America at the minute. Hmm. Um, they get relatively big by the end of the Cretaceous. And they're very, very fragmentary. So I think, you know, possibly that that those extra air cavities make their bones a bit more fragile. But we have somewhere around six to eight species of Megaraptorid and they're all less than 15% complete. They're so scrappy. I mean, we, we kind of know what they look like because you can form a composite from all the bits and pieces of the, the individual Megaraptorids, but we don't have a really well-associated one. So we understand so little about them. It, it impedes our ability to see their evolutionary relationships with other theropods and, you know, understand what they're doing. Um, you asked me in the email when we were discussing this if you, you weren't sure whether to be saying Megaraptors, Megaraptorids, Megaraptorins. If we go into a bit of um, you know, a bit of theropod evolution, Megaraptora with the A on the end, it's a broad group. The early ones appear to be in... Asia, so we've got two from Thailand and one from Japan, and then everything else, Megaraptora day, the the more, uh, I guess, more evolved, more derived group, mm-hmm. are only from Gondwana, so that's South American and Australian stuff. So I'm primarily interested in the Megaraptorids, the ones from Gondwana. So if I say Megaraptors, Megaraptorids, whatever, I'm, I'm today, I'm talking about everything from Gondwana. You know, it's it's still a bit but, conspicuous. But we do think there's the a stuff, bigger group there. Sorry, we do think there's a bigger group there uh, originating in Asia. Well, that's the difficult thing. The ones in Asia, the earlier ones, I mean, they're only about 5 million years earlier or the same age mm-hmm. as the stuff in Victoria. And we're already pretty far away from Asia geographically at that time of the Cretaceous. So either we've got a ghost lineage going so far back that, and there's no rock that preserves the fossils that show, you know, the the origin of the group. Um, so, you know, it's possible that Megaraptorins or whatever became Megaraptorins was present in both the North and the South Southern Hemispheres in the early Cretaceous or late Jurassic and managed to spread mm-hmm. to both places and then become what they are in Asia and what they are in Australia and South America. Or, you know, it might be a convergent evolution thing, something like, you know, um, the big cats around all the other continents where they kind of, they're doing a similar thing, but they're not actually. Well, I guess the big cats are probably a terrible example there because they are related. Um, uh, what's a good example? I think you can point to something like a, a dolphin and a shark, right? Which both have the same body form, but are from radically different family trees. Correct. That's me um, limiting myself to the terrestrial realm. I don't often think about the oceans, <laughs> but correct. It's it might be that they're not actually related to each other, but they look similar and they're doing a similar thing in different environments. Um, so, you know, there's always a bit of debate whether or not the stuff in Asia is related to the stuff here in South America. Um, most of your phylogenetic analysis or pretty much, you know, your, your, uh, your tests to see how theropods are related to each other. They say they're related, but again, like I've said, these are all very scrappy, not very well preserved animals. Mm-hmm. We kind of need, we're waiting for some more complete material to bridge the gaps and see you know, see if it can improve our understanding. I mean, it could be that they're related and they just separated so long ago or that, yeah, they convergently evolved to look similar, but they seem to be pretty successful in Gondwana, not so much in Laurasia. Yeah. So there's uh, two sort of divergent lines of questioning which go in opposite directions out of that. The first is uh, what distinguishes them, what, what shows that they're unique or what shows that they're different? And then is there an indication or what do you think we're missing from the group? What do we not know as such? Can we we'll start with the first one? What what are the distinguishing characteristics of those Australian megaraptids? Between other megaraptids or like the early Asian stuff? 
Well, in general, what what really makes them stand out? You mentioned the big claws, for example. So yeah. we can think about other theropods, and you know the the classic theropod is a is a Tyrannosaurus rex, which has distinctly small arms compared to its body. Yeah, and lots of other theropods are like that, but not all of them necessarily. And you've got something like the Therizinosaurs, which do have very large claws, but were probably herbivore herbivores rather than yeah. Uh, yeah. carnivores so yeah is there is there anything else that we can look at at what we do have from megaraptor and say this is what's a distinguishing feature of that group do you think yeah well i guess like the key one is the vertebrae you've got those really big air sacs compared to anything else um mm-hmm. that's kind of your, your guaranteed megaraptor feature um the claws when they do preserve for body size completely massive compared to anything else i mean I guess mm-hmm. spinosaurs approach similar shape claws, those kind of sickle-like ones, and they're thought to be using them for maybe, you know, hooking fish or something. But relative to body size, they're not as big as something like a megaraptorid claw. Um, it's And it's, I mean, the teeth, the teeth are just so small and have been confused for dromaeosaur teeth before, small ones like, rap, you know, the raptors. Um the, just the tooth to met, like mouth ratio in size yeah. is just so drastically different. Again, key thing being we kind of have an understanding of the snout and the elongation of megaraptorids from we've got the lower jaw of Australopithecus, which is the only uh, the best preserved Australian species, and we have the upper jaw of a juvenile megaraptor that may not actually be megaraptor. There's a bit of debate as to whether that is associated referable to megaraptor the species so Mm -hmm. we're just lacking you know we've got ideas based on the partial material we have but we're lacking really definitive things the only thing that is truly definitive is the vertebrae and the forearms just the size of the forearms and the size of the claws on these forearms are just unlike anything else in the group yeah can we, uh, you, you mentioned Australovenator, which is, of course, the logo of my podcast for the last two yep. years now. So, uh, and uh, and you also mentioned early on Lightning Claw, uh, yep. which I think is not a not an actually named theropod. Is that correct? No, it's not. It's unofficially referred to Lightning as Lightning Claw. Uh, are there many other named species out there? What What can we say about the different species that we do have? Yeah, look, I mean, we've got two names from Australia, Australia Veneta, Wintonensis, your best one, your most complete from the winter formation in central Queensland. That gives us some of the, honestly, it's one of the better preserved megaraptorids because we've got a full forelimb, a full hind limb and the bottom jaw. Um, and it just, you know, we can see similarities with other stuff from, say, South America or anything else you find in Australia. The second species that's named from Australia is Rapator ornithylistoides. It was named in 1932. It is a single bone. It's just a metal carpal. It's a part of the hand. It doesn't really tell us too much, unfortunately, um, except that we can compare it to the same element in Australia and say, yep, these are both megaraptorids. They're different. But that's about all I can tell you. You've mentioned those uh, South American examples a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what's over there? So you've got several species. So quick one, the Australian record of Megaraptorids stretches from about 122 million years, um, which is what we find in Victoria, all the way up to 95 million years ago, which is Australia Veneta. Um, the South American record starts around the 90 million years mark and goes towards the end of the Cretaceous. And you've got several species. You've got Megaraptor, Orcoraptor, uh, Tradienia, Murusraptor, and then Mape, Macrothorax, is the last one and the largest one. But that's We're starting to push the really big theropod sizes with Mape because it's just, um, yeah, just in size. But a lot of these don't have comparative material. So Megaraptor and Australia we can compare really well. They've both got pretty good fall-in material that we mm. can cross-check. Something like Murus Raptor is it's the brain case in the back of the skull, whereas we have the front of the lower jaw in Australia so we're kind of lacking that comparative material. Tradienia is just a vertebral column from about the mid-body, and Australia doesn't really have any vertebrae to compare to. Uh, this, this is the thing where 
there's a lot of individual bits that don't have that cross-reference. They look different enough from other theropods and mm. seem to be megaraptorids, but within megaraptorids, we start to struggle in comparing things. But yes, they've got a, They've dispersed into South America at some stage. Current thoughts, because of the fossil material and record we have, is that maybe they originate in Australia and in Victoria. In Victoria, we have the oldest megaraptorid material in the world. So current mm. signs point that you know, maybe they originated in Victoria and they've spread north into Australia, gone through Antarctica and gone into um, South America in the other direction. So we hopefully expect to see megaraptorids from uh, Antarctica at some point. And that'll support, you know, definitely they've dispersed that way. Or, you know, we don't have that earlier rock in South America. They might have originated there and come through Antarctica into Australia. It's just, it's hard to say with the fossil record. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a challenge because although we know that close relationship between An- Antarctica, South America and Australia, the Antarctic, and Antarctic record is very limited. Yep. The Australian record doesn't go into the latest Cretaceous. And okay. then uh, in, in South America, you tend to get stuff from the latest Cretaceous. <laughs> so yep. you, you almost so, have no overlap there. That's the thing. We're, we're lacking overlap in material. We're lacking overlap in age. And we're missing, yeah, like you said, in Antarctica, we're missing that bridge, that connection that will kind of link the story. But that's paleontology yeah. for you, you know. It's not always cut and dry and easy. Um, we work with what we're given, and we we just we just try and try and build the story as we go. Yeah. From what we do have, do you think you can point to the missing pieces? Like, if you think of a if you think of a really giant puzzle, right? Mm-hmm. And you let's say you only have forty percent of the puzzle, but you can still put it together and say, oh, there's some sky and clouds in this section. There's a Here's the outline of it, for example, and we might say, oh, there's a few pieces there of a building, so we think we've got some sort of urban landscape, right? Just yep. just to give a, a broad outline of what a puzzle might look like, we're even with a bunch of pieces missing. If we assume that's kind of what we're looking at with with megaraptors uh, and particularly the Australian megaraptors, the, uh, there's lots of missing puzzle pieces, but do you have an outline or what do you think we are missing that might be out there somewhere? I know that's getting a bit speculative, but... Yeah, look, I mean, associated material in Australia is always the big kicker. Um, So when I say associated, it's, you know, it's bones that represent one animal. It's great to have bones that represent individuals of a species or a taxon, I suppose, but we're very, very, very limited in associated theropods. There's four published specimens from the country. Um, mm-hmm. You've got Australovenida. You've got another different megaraptorid from the Winton Formation, but comparative, it's fairly scrappy. You've got Lightning Claw. I've talked about Lightning Claw a lot. Lightning Claw is an unnamed megaraptorid species from Lightning Ridge in New South Wales. It's from those black opal fields. The specimen itself is opalized. It's great. It's brilliant. That one's a bit scrappy, not as complete, but again, that's the third example of a associated theropod and then the fourth is is two pubic bones from victoria and that's it that's that's our record of associated theropods what will bridge the gap is your associated material because then we can start to compare and contrast when they have overlap to the other associated theropods and that's how you start to get your 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 taxa and your species described in name because obviously today you know that kind of spread you there's not a lot of species terrestrial species anyway that uh, actually have that kind of spread right that from from all the way in central Queensland town to southern Victoria uh, and still uh, are the same species you know exactly. they might be the and genera but yeah that's it and it's just such a difference in the environment I mean in Victoria 120 to 108 million years ago we're still in the pole like the Antarctic Circle um, mm-hmm. you've got you've got forests and big rivers maybe snow maybe not but not a complete ice coverage like antarctica is now and then you go into winton and you've got i think they they refer to kind of like massive billabongs and such big swampy areas it's it's such a difference in environment but they're able to spread and disperse throughout the whole country and we see them all up the eastern coast of the cretaceous from victoria into new south wales into queensland 
So yeah, it is it is very interesting that they're able to to be that dominant in Australia, whereas you've got such a diversity of relatively big things in South America. You get the Carcharodontosaurs, you get the Abelosaurs, you get Unenlagines, you get Megaraptorids, you get a you get a really big spread. Whereas, you know, you, when you think of theropods, you think of the big ones. We haven't got a be a truly big one from Australia yet. It might mm. be environment. It might be that they're actually absent because Australia always seems to be weird with its natural history. It's hard to say. Yeah. We, you know, even today, there's not really a a, a large predator uh, in the same no. way. So. That's it. We don't have a we don't have a yeah. big cat, unless you believe the mm. what is it? Is it a black a big black cat on the Gippsland coast? The cryptid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think the 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 notion of um, panthers or whatever are hiding in the forest is all up and down the the east coast, or at least uh, yep. in New South Wales and Victoria. So, uh, but that's <laughs> there's definitely no fossil the record one. of those. No. <laughs> now, Jake. What um, uh, obviously you you've not quite uh, reached the end of the PhD yet. You still got a bit of a way to go. Uh, so I might be getting ahead of you here. But what does your research tell us at this point? What do you think the implication for the work that you're doing is going to have in terms of understanding theropod evolution? Well, I think the big one is the Victorian record. Like I said, we've got the oldest megaraptorids in the world in Victoria from the Upper Strzelecki Group. So that's the Gippsland Basin, uh, east and southern coast of Victoria. Um, we got yeah, we've got the oldest megaraptorids, but we've also got a very big collection of material. Like I said, they're they're often isolated, crushed individual elements, but there's such a diversity in groups of theropods that it's going to give us an understanding of what's here. If if you know, it, I I doubt based on the material we have, we'll be able to establish species or taxa because I don't want to contribute to the issue of one bone taxa. You know, like I said with Raptor mm. earlier. It's hard to say much else other than it's not Australovenidum. So it's it's going to be looking at what groups of theropods are here. There's often bones like in the limbs that can help you tell the difference between theropod groups. So that's going to tell us our diversity. Um, things like lightning claw, when I reassess that, will tell us things about, okay, how is this associated theropod different from the other associated theropods? What can we, and, you know, broadleaf, different to the ones in South America because we've had a few species named since lightning claw was looked at. Um, it's, it's, it's really just trying to contribute to what groups of theropods have we actually got in Australia and Victoria will tell us the most. So then if they're present in Victoria in the early Cretaceous, could that indicate that they might be present elsewhere in Australia later on? Are they able to move up North into New South Wales and Queensland? Um, would we expect to be able to look for them? You know, we don't want to kind of build that idea of, oh, you know, Jake's seen an abelis or something like Carnotaurus in Victoria. It's definitely in Queensland, but it, it opens them up for, you know, could they be here? And we already, we, we start to think those things because of the South American record. Australia's Cretaceous is very closely tied to that of South America, particularly Argentina, because that's where most of the material comes from. We, you know, we 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 hope to see some of their big groups here in Australia. We just don't have that evidence yet. But if we can use the pretty diverse record of Victoria to establish some of those groups, it, it just helps with the evidence and it helps understand Australia's natural history better. Because, yeah, compared to something like the megafauna record we have and the stuff that Flinders looks at, the dinosaur record is just not as great, and it needs a lot of work because we have our own unique, really exciting ecosystems to look into and. And it's yeah, it's a little bit sad that not really many people in Australia know it. Uh, can I ask you to dig into those ecosystems a little bit more? What uh, what other animals, other dinosaurs, do we think might have been inhabiting alongside some of these some of these theropods? Do we know much about that? Uh, mainly from Winton and Victoria. So in Victoria, we've got a ton of little ornithopods. So ornithopods are your kind of your herbivorous dinosaurs. Um, they're part of a big group, Ornithischia, that includes... Ornithischia is massive. It includes things like the hadrosaurs, the ceratopsians, things like triceratops. Sorry, the ankylosaurs, the stegosaurs. It's a big group. Ornithopods are kind of like, I guess, you know, yet when you think of a default herbivorous dinosaur, things mm -hmm. like the hadrosaurs, something like Mataburosaurus is an ornithopod. 
Yeah. Um, we've got a ton of small, seemingly bipedal ones all throughout Victoria, both the Upper Strasleki Group on the Gippsland Coast and the Umarala Formation on the Otway Coast. Massive diversity of those. Weird things we get, though, is um, particularly in the Upper Strasleki Group, we get Temnus Fondles, so these kind of big uh, toilet seat shaped head amphibians that were thought to go extinct a lot earlier um, in the fossil, sorry, a lot later in the fossil record, but they make it to the Cretaceous in Victoria. Um, it's just a very, very strange environment. Like I said before, in Victoria, you know, we've got, we got forests, we're in the Antarctic Circle. It's, a, it's an environment we don't see today. You know, like I said, there's ice covering Antarctica right now. There wasn't a complete ice sheet covering it. We've got this massive spread of theropods and ornithopods throughout Victoria in this forest ecosystem with these big rivers that we've got ev evidence of from the sedimentology. So it's it's very unique and we don't see anything like it today and rarely in the fossil record. Places like Winton are very strange because you've got, like I said, you've got this massive diversity of sauropods and so many sauropods and then megaraptorids alongside them, which are a fraction of the size of these animals. Mm -hmm. it, you'd, you'd find it difficult to say something like Australovenator that's about the size of a horse hunting something bigger than a two, three-story building, something like Diamantinosaurus or Savannosaurus. So it's, you know, again, it's, it's difficult. It's a different environment because we're not seeing those big theropods like Carcharodontosaurs, which are thought to be sauropod specialists, like you see in South America. Um. I, unfortunately, I don't know as much about the Winton, uh, sorry, the Grime and Creek formation, the stuff in Lightning Ridge, but I do know, again, they have megaraptorids, they have ornithopods. Um, and, you know, yeah, so that's we just seem to see collected. this relationship. We seem to see this relationship across the continent then, and, uh, and then, yeah, also the sauropods sort of roaming around yep. as well. So. Uh, when, when you talk about the ornithopods, are we thinking about something like uh, Lealinosaura or...? Yep, that's what you're thinking. You're thinking small yep. bipedal things like Lealinosaura, Quantosaurus. I can't remember all the taxa and my friend Rui will kill me for it because he loves them so much and he's worked on them quite a bit. But, um, <laughs> no, that's uh, okay. There's, there's, <laughs> there's so many of them and there's so we find so much material of them. I mean, like I said, I was just on the dig, uh, the Dinosaur Dreaming dig, two days ago and we found a lot of ornithopod material mm -hmm. they're just so frequent they're so common there's so much of them right. uh the other thing that you mentioned and, and has come up quite a few times is uh this notion of how do we get the message out about australian dinosaurs and how cool some of them some of them are what are some of the ways that you do try to communicate your research to the public look i try a few things i mean this is the third podcast i've been on and you know they're, they've all been paleontology geared podcasts, but mm -hmm. they'll all have a different audience and you know different reach. Um, I've spoken at Pine of Science, which is kind of just like a a very relaxed, have a beer at a pub and listen to a scientific talk that's kind of accessible. Um, I was invited to. I guess the strangest one I've done is I got married in Harcourt, which is a country town in Victoria, at the end of 2022, and my celebrant. And her husband organized this thing called Harcourt Apple Fest. The town's known for its apples. And they had this guy in a dinosaur costume come out every year. And they're like, oh, well, let's get a paleontologist to talk about dinosaurs in Harcourt. I gave a talk there to this group of kids. Um, you know, I try things like social media profiles, Instagram, Twitter, just to share my research or just talk about Australian dinosaur stuff. It's mm -hmm. I, I'm just trying any avenue I can to talk about them because... Like I said, I mean, you could you could go to a classroom, you could go to a pub, you could go anywhere, and you could ask people if they could name a dinosaur. Everyone will put their hand up, and then you pick ninety five percent of them will say, I don't know, T Rex, Triceratops, Stegosaurus, which is great. Yeah. They're well known dinosaurs, but they're from the northern hemisphere. And then if you ask those same people, can you name an Australian dinosaur? You watch most of them put their hand down, and it's just about yeah. trying to say, hey, look. You know, we do have this these great dinosaurs here. They're so unique compared to the rest of the world. And, our, you know, we're building up on that story. We haven't been d 
describing dinosaurs for 200 years like they have in the UK. Megalosaurus, the first dinosaur, turned 200 a couple of days ago. We haven't been doing it for 200 years. I mean, yeah, the first dinosaur fossil was found in the early 1900s in Victoria, but dinosaur paleontology has only really taken off since the 80s in this country, thanks to stuff by like Patton Tom Rich or Ralph Molnar, uh, those early paleontologists in, in Australia working on material. And then Winton's just exploded thanks to Dave Elliott um, stumbling across sauropods there and then inviting out paleontologists. And now it seems like, I guess we're in our golden age. We're in our early golden age of dinosaur paleo and we're up and coming and it's good to kind of spread that information and teach people, yeah, we've got our own really cool stuff here. Let's learn more about it. Yeah, absolutely. Jake, uh, if people want to follow some of your work, what's the best way they can do that? Um, I share my research on Instagram. I am under theropods down under. There's um, spaces between the theropods down and under. Um, I'm also on Twitter under Dino Man Jake. Um, I try to make my research accessible on those in that I, I try to step back on the jargon and make it as easy as possible. But a difficult thing with paleontology research is it's very jargon heavy and it's mm -hmm. often not accessible if you're not in the field. So I'm always open to people reaching out and asking, hey, I saw your paper what does it mean and you know if you're not a paleontologist you probably don't want to sit there and read a very detailed description about every single angle of a bone but you'd like to reach out and ask what does this skull mean and you know i i published yeah. my first paper last a second paper last year and it was on a skull bone it's like well this looks much more much different to a skull bone from south america it's different evolutionarily what does that mean and i can I make it a bit more accessible i suppose uh, well, having uh, sat here and asked you questions about what all this means for the last uh, 45 minutes or so, Jake Koteski, thank you very much for sharing your research and insight with me on fossils and fiction. Beautiful. Thank you so much for having me, Travis. It was great. Um, really just appreciate the opportunity to have someone listen to me talk about dinosaurs. <laughs> I look for any excuse, honestly. Absolutely. Thanks to Jake for that interview and his expertise. Make sure to check out Jake's account on Instagram at theropods down under with underscores between each word. Join me next time on Fossils and Fiction. Thanks for listening. Find more info on the web at fossilsfiction.co and across social media. Follow and rate us on your favourite podcasting platform. If you have a story to share on the podcast, please get in touch. The theme music is Sonora by Casmoray.